thank you that, for that introduction to, to the palace. I should, out of courtesy, place on record the apologies of the current administration for any uh, past assassinations of uh, <laughs> archbishops um, conducted by Tories or otherwise, uh, and assure the audience that the, the past is not necessarily a guide to the future or the present. <laughs> uh, um, but um, Philip and his public, congratulations on this report. Very timely, very challenging, uh, uh, very good. Uh, most kids I know uh, look forward to the school holidays. Um, some of you will have seen a very powerful documentary recently called Poor Kids, which made a very powerful point that we have far too many children in this country who associate school holidays with hunger. Uh, a lady called Rachel Warwick watched that program. Uh, she's a church girl and decided to do something about it. And so she set up a project called Lunch. Does what it says on the tin. That church provides, during the school holidays, uh, lunch for local kids who need it. And if you watch the video around this project, you'll see that so many benefits flow from that. A wonderful network called the Cinnamon Network, some of you will know, led by the inspirational Matt Bird, uh, spotted this project, shared it, with other churches in that network that are looking to develop what they call community franchises. And this summer, 30 more churches will be looking to adopt lunch. Uh, it's one of 30 projects that the Cinnamon Network are sharing and evangelizing. Over 3,000 churches are involved in that network. This year, they'll mobilize around 50,000 volunteers. Around 600,000 people will benefit from those projects. Um, they're in part able to do that because they've received over a million pounds from my department to support their work. So Philip and his report is challenging the government to get into what is called horizontal partnerships. Uh, in the church. I think sometimes my, my life has been one long search for horizontal partnerships. Uh, but this is one I'm in and, uh, and I'm thoroughly uh, enjoying uh, because I can see that it is making such a positive difference to so many people's uh, lives. And it's part, but I could tell you stories from my own constituency, you know, where we're beginning to think quite seriously about how we cope with an aging population in what is already an aging constituency. My first port of call in calling the Queens together is to talk to local church leaders because I recognise that their work, they are already doing to support older residents is uh, uh, far more effective than anything else that is going on uh, in the area. So I uh, am a total believer uh, in, in the power of the church and faith networks in relation to into social action, an enormously powerful network in terms of values that can be shared, inspirational people, brain power, buildings, assets of all, of, 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 all, of all sorts, incredibly powerful. And I think the report does a fantastically good job in just making that live. Um, but the report, just as it challenges the Archbishop, challenges the government challenges us to do more and to think harder about how we can embrace that power and make that power work for the wider common good and part of the big challenge that, that we face, which the Archbishop touched on. And there, you know, he was a pain not to make a political point, and I thank him for that, but actually there isn't a whole lot of politics in this anymore. Whoever wins the next general election, it's going to be the same public spending is going to contract. And therefore, as a country, as a society, we face this big challenge. How are we going to do a better job about the social problems that undermine the country? Uh, how are we going to meet the public's demand for better services when the state has got uh, uh, less money? And, you know, ladies and gentlemen, may be quite honest, and it's good to see Stephen Timms at the back, back of the room uh, here. You know, the words, oh, well, of course, we've got to do more with less, or we've got to do better with less, trip very easily from the lips of politicians. I found myself using that expression. But my God, the underlying reality of that, of that challenge is enormous. And I don't think, ladies and gentlemen, we have even begun to engage seriously with the debate of what that really means to make that, uh, that happen. But fundamentally, we must 
be honest with ourselves and recognize it means doing things in very different ways uh, from uh, uh, the past. And uh, I am very clear, not just because it's my job, the broader civil society and the church and the faith networks are going to be an enormously important part of this in two ways. The first is the way that is very visible now, a very traditional role, which is that of voice. Because this is going to get messy. Um, because things are going to be done in different ways. Things are going to be taken away. And I'm not just talking about things that you can see and observe now, like welfare reform and the debate around that. I'm talking about the things we can't yet see, because we don't know, for example, quite yet, you know, how local authorities are going to react on the ground to the fact that they're going to have uh, less uh, less money. And in that process, you know, I start from the premise that people like Stephen and I get up every morning thinking about how we can make a positive difference. Governments are, on the whole, well-intentioned. But we're clunky and we make mistakes and sometimes we don't think things through. And the role, the historic, fundamental role of civil society of speaking truth to power from a base of much better knowledge around uh, need from a position of being much closer to the people uh, affected. That, that voice must not be stilled. And there I have colleagues who say, oh, you know, the bishops keep their nose out of politics, business, but I've never believed in that. Um, civil society, uh, church network, that voice will never be more important now as we go into this incredibly difficult period. But the challenge that the report sets us, and which I accept, is actually can we go beyond that in terms of a more uh, constructive partnership role for civil society um, uh, in, in this process and explicitly for church networks? And I absolutely uh, embrace that um, for, for, for this reason. I simply cannot see, as I think the Archbishop alluded to, how we are going to make it through this period uh, without constructing really genuine partnerships that go way beyond lip service between government that has got to be a whole lot humbler, civil society that is getting stronger. I, mean, I know there's a lot of noise around pressure on charities uh, through a very difficult, bumpy period. No one knows that more than me. Um, but civil society is getting stronger because power is shifting away from politicians. Trust is moving. And it's in part moving to civil society because civil society is trusted and with trust flows power, power magnified by the power of this in terms of the ability to mobilize, inform, enrage, uh, inspire uh, uh, people. This is a absolutely fundamental shift. So I'm absolutely clear that the role of civil society, is, as, as government get hum gets humbler, the role of civil society uh, is going to get stronger. And then the third pillar of all this, which again I think the Archbishop alluded to, is the role of the private sector. Enormous shifts I see beginning to happen there because they have a huge problem around the word trust. And I spent an evening at the Royal Albert Hall. Um, I played the Royal Albert Hall on stage with Joanna Lumley for a minute, uh, full of business leaders. Table after table, they were talking about the same thing, which is the word trust and how they regain it. And they recognize thing, that there's a shift in society about our attitudes as consumers, and as employees, the values of organizations matter much more. How organizations behave matter uh, much more. And therefore, I can see this opportunity with these shifts in terms of how government has got to act, how the opportunity around civil society, and how business is changing uh, its attitudes in response to us and society values, to construct a much more effective uh, partnership which draws on all the resources of the country, and you can call it whole society, and you can call it, like my boss does, big society, but it's got, to, it's never been more relevant uh, than, uh, uh, than now. So um, I, I totally embrace the message of the reports and the underlying uh, instincts. Of, and ladies and gentlemen, this is beginning to happen already. Uh, if you believe The Guardian, and sometimes I do, a uh, report recently says that uh, almost 20, 25% of local authorities are already you know, passing statutory funding to local 
uh, ch church groups to work with them. Now, the question is, if this is already happening, if the pressures for this are going to grow and grow, is there, do we need to create the kind of space that the report says for government and the church to sit and talk through some of the issues and sensitivities that underlie this? Uh, uh, I'm absolutely open to this. My door is a very modest one in the middle of the cabinet office, but if you want to start with me, then I may be in a position to open uh, bigger, more impressive doors across the system because the time for this debate is is absolutely that. So congratulations, Philip. Congratulations, Republica. A good, challenging, very timely report.